Thanks, Tim. Leslie, for leading us in worship this morning. As we approach Romans 8 this morning, would you just hear spoken over you these words from 2 Corinthians chapter 1? Every one of God's promises is yes in Jesus Christ. Through him we also say amen to the glory of God. Now it is God who strengthens us together with you in Christ and who has anointed us. He has also put his seal on us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a down payment. Father, as we come to this passage in Romans 8, we are headed towards this grand conclusion where we are more than overcomers. And the picture that the Apostle Paul is painting in Romans 8 is that even as we suffer and groan, we are more than overcomers through Christ who loves us. You strengthen us and you've given us your Spirit as a seal and as a guarantee. And so we're asking for this grace over the next few weeks that you would help us to understand and to see and live into this truth and this hope that we can be more than overcomers even in a world of suffering and groaning. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. I think most of you who have either had this conversation or a conversation very similar. It takes place in different forms at work, sometimes in coaching and teams, sometimes with friends, or sometimes in a context like this. So your wife and you are invited to go to some kind of event, special event, requires you to be dressed up a little bit, Christmas party, work function, something, suit and tie kind of thing. So you've, you've put on your suit, you've, you've put on your tie, it, it's time to leave, and so you're in the living room and, and you're headed out and your wife says to you, are you going to wear that tie? Right? That question comes in different forms, but you're right. So you, you fight off the urge to be sarcastic you know, no, this is my practice tie. Uh, but then you realize, right, the question that is asked is different than the message being communicated, right? The question being asked is, are you going to wear that tie? The message being communicated is, you're not going to wear that tie, right? We, we understand that dynamic. That, like that plays out at work, is that the report you're going to submit, right? And, well, I guess it's not the report I'm going to submit. So, uh, so if, you're, if you're aware of that dynamic of being asked a question, but the message being communicated is not exactly the words of the question, then you're ready for the ending of Romans chapter 8. This last section of Romans chapter 8, Paul is going to uh, riddle us with six different questions. Who can be against us? How will God not give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Who is there to condemn? Who shall separate us from the love of God? And there's even this list of seven things with the question, shall these seven things separate us for the love of God? And as we're going through these questions, that's kind of what we're going to discover. The, the words of the question are different than the message that Paul was trying to communicate by asking that question. And all of these questions are really headed us towards this triumphant ending of Romans 8. Believe it or not, we're getting to the end of Romans 8. Uh, this is sermon number 12. We only have two more after this. I know 12 weeks ago when I told you we'd be spending 14 weeks in Romans 8, y'all were uh, aghast at least. But now that we've been in Romans 8, I think y'all understand we could spend a whole lot more time here, right? This has been an incredible chapter of Scripture, and we're getting towards the end. I told you this at the very beginning. I want to know how we arrive at verse 37. I want to know how we get to this place where, in spite of all of this, we can say we are more than conquerors. And so we're at the, the last section, and Paul is leading us there through these questions. Six questions. We could probably address them all in one sermon, but I'm going to break it into three sermons because... As you've probably noticed in Romans 8, there's really no spare words in Romans 8. It's not like you can get to this phrase and it's like, well, we don't really need that phrase. We can skip over that. No, every phrase that gets laid down in Romans 8 is headed towards a point. And I think it's really an, an important question to ask, how can we be more than conquerors in a world in which we are suffering and groaning? How do you get there? And so these steps that are leading us to that statement, I think we need to slow down and make sure we get every one of them. 
Let's go ahead and read the final paragraph here, Romans 8, and we'll come back and pay attention to verses 31 and 32. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, and more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So let's just look this morning at the first two questions that get asked in those first two verses. This whole section is introduced with the question, what shall we say to these Things. So I guess technically there are seven questions in this section. That's really kind of the first. What shall we say to these things? And these things are not just the sentence that has come before, but these things really are the totality of Romans 8. And just to give you the litany one more time so that we know what Paul's talking about, the first 17 verses of Romans 8 talks about who we are in Christ. The penalty of sin has been paid. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. We are justified by grace through faith. The power of sin has been broken. The Spirit has set us free from the power of sin and death. We have been reborn in our mind and in our will, so our mind now can discern the things of the Spirit of God. The Spirit of the eternal triune God dwells within us, and we are being transformed by that Spirit and putting to death the deeds of the flesh by that Spirit. The Spirit gives life to our mortal bodies. So the life of joy and peace and hope and love that is poured into these mortal bodies. As children of God, we are led by the Spirit, guided by the Spirit. The Spirit bears witness with our spirits that we are children of God. So there's that assurance of the Spirit, the confirmation of the Spirit. Uh, We are adopted children of God, full legal heirs, fellow heirs with Christ. We are sealed by the Spirit to participate in God's divine eternal plan, which is to be glorified with Him. So the verse, first part of that is this is who you are in Christ. And then starting in verse 18, it's this is who we are in Christ in a world that is very broken. And so there's the suffering of the present time. And just because you're in Christ, you're not going to be exempt from that. But we suffer differently. We suffer because we have the indwelling Holy Spirit who comforts us. We suffer because we've identified with Christ. And so some of our suffering is because we bear the name of Christ. There's the groaning of creation. We feel it too, but we are hoping that creation is going to be liberated from the bondage to uh, despair, and we get to be a part of that because of the redemption of our bodies when God makes all things new, and we get to be a part of that with our resurrected, immortal, imperishable body. So we're hoping for that, and we're waiting for that, but God's not left us alone, so He's given us the gift of the Spirit, and the Spirit is in our hearts interceding for us according to the will of God. We rest under the promise God causes all things to work together for good, and how do we know that last week predestined uh, excuse me uh, foreknown predestined called justified and glorified so when Paul gets to this and says what do we say about all these things he's talking about all of Romans 8 and it is a mouthful it is a spiritful to say what do we say for all of these things I say that just to clarify this what we are about to read Paul's not speaking these words to those who just want to sprinkle a little Jesus on their life He's not saying these words to those who just want to be good people and and love others, which is a good calling, but that's not the calling of, of being a Christian. He's not speaking to those who are hoping they can manipulate God to protect them from from any difficulties in life. Let me say this again. This last section of Romans 8 will make no sense to you if your expectation is that you're somehow going to be able to get Christ to exempt you from suffering or groaning or hoping and waiting. He is speaking to those who are in Christ. 
He is speaking to those who have been radically reborn and indwelt by God's Spirit. He is speaking to those who love God and who are called according to His purpose. He is speaking to those, in verse 17, who want to suffer with Christ so that they can be glorified. He is speaking to those, in verse 5, who have set their mind on things of the Spirit, not things of the flesh. He is speaking to those, in verse 13, who want to put to death the deeds of the flesh by the indwelling Spirit. He is speaking to those, in verse 26, who pray groaning prayers because they know what they're hoping for because what they're hoping for is so different than what they see, and so they groan. These are the people who is speaking to. And he says to them, in all of this stuff, we are more than conquerors. Now, I've got some questions about that. How do you get from suffering, groaning, hoping, and waiting to be more than conquerors? And that's where he leads us through this path to try to get there. So this, if you leave feeling this sermon's not quite complete, it's because it's not. It's about a third heading towards that verse 37, okay? So let's look at the first question. Verse 31, if God is for us, who can be against us? Or your translation may say, who is against us? Let's just look at the premise If God is for us, how do we know that God is for us? How do we have that conviction? Well, Romans 8 basically has been a running commentary on that fact that God is for us. He sent, God demonstrated His love for us, so He sent His Son to die on the cross for our sins so that we can be justified by grace through faith. There's no condemnation. His Spirit indwells us. He's adopted us to be a child of the King. He's sealed us so we can be part of God's divine eternal plan. I mean, Romans 8 is just one long testimony that God is for us. So if you got any friends and you invite them to church and say, yeah, we've been talking about Romans 8 for 14 weeks, and like, well, what's the sermon? What's, the, what's Romans 8 about? This is a pretty good four-word summary of Romans 8. God is for us. And just read the whole chapter and how it describes God's for us by this way and this way and this way. But imagine if you didn't have that confidence. Imagine if you didn't know that. What if God was not for you? Or what if he was for you some days and against you some days? What if he was temperamental? What if it depended upon what kind of mood he woke up to in the morning? What if he didn't know for sure God is for us? You know, we uh, were reading through the Old Testament in our discipleship groups. Uh, We started in Genesis we read through some of the Exodus stories, and now we're into that part of the wilderness wanderings as God's leading them to the promised land. And there, there's all these stories in the Old Testament where you see God's wrath kind of on full display. So there's the, the sons of Aaron who offer strange fire before the Lord of the tabernacle. They didn't follow God's rules, and the, the fire of God comes out of the tabernacle and just uh, you know, incinerates them at the spot. There's uh, the rebellion of Korah, who rebels against Moses' leadership, and the ground swallows up Korah. There's, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah and the fire that falls. I mean, there's all these stories of, of God's wrath in, in the Old Testament. And the, the truth of the matter is, that is exactly what we deserve. If mercy is God not giving us what we do deserve, and grace is God giving us what we do not deserve, we, that should be flipped. God should give us what we do deserve, and He should not give us what we do not deserve. But that changes in Romans 8 because we are in Christ. It does not change because we've gone to church enough times. It does not change because we're trying to get our act together. It does not change because we're good people. It changes simply because we are in Christ. This is this word that Paul uses in Romans that we never use, the word propitiation, right? Right? took me four years in seminary before I could actually pronounce that word. Propitiation. It means to satisfy the wrath. Right? So God's wrath was satisfied by Jesus' atoning death on the cross. That's why we can even make that statement so cleanly. God is for us. And the cross has changed that. And we can say with confidence, God is for us. And so the... the Question, if God is for us, then here's the question, who can be against us? You know, that's kind of a strange question 
when you think about it, which is why I think the words of the question is different than the message that he's trying to communicate. Uh, last week was the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church, and been reading some statistics and realities about that. And when you start reading that, you realize there's a quite a large group of people who are against the people of God. I mean, the, the, uh, the chosen people of God, the Jewish people, we've been seeing this just in the last few weeks, just the incredible uprising of anti-Semitism around the world. It's, it's been pretty shocking. You realize in the United States, Jews are 2% of the population, and yet over 50% of hate crimes are against them. Uh, we've seen this as God's chosen people just experience hate all around the world. But Christians are actually the largest persecuted people group on the planet, religious group on, on the planet. Um, not so in the Western world where there's freedom of speech and freedom of religion. We don't experience persecution. But in much of the world where freedom of religion is not a reality, Christians are extremely persecuted. One in seven Christians around the world are persecuted. 20% of Christians in Africa experience persecution. 40% of Christians in Asia experience persecution. 312 million Christians around the world encounter very high or extreme levels of oppression today. My point is just simply saying, when Paul asked the question, who can be against us? There are 312 million Christians on the globe today who could give Paul a name and an address. God before us, who can be against us? Well, I can tell you. Bob down the street, and it's that person over there, and it's that government official over there, and it's that, right? And, and Paul's got his own list of names. Paul didn't have to Google persecuted church. Paul had his own list of people who were very much so against him. His persecution resume in 2 Corinthians 11, five times I received the 39 lashes, three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, on and on it goes. Paul's got a pretty good list of names of people who have been against him. And even Romans 8, I mean, you read Romans 8, verse 17, if we want to be glorified with Him, if we're going to be heirs with Christ, part of that is suffering with Him. So when we get to the question, if God be for us, who can be against us? The message that's being communicated is not just the words of the question, because it's not that no one will be against us. But it is, if God is for us, then nothing can keep Him from accomplishing His plan in and through us. That's the message that is being communicated. I think it's interesting that Paul writes, if God is for us, who can be against us? I think it would have made much more sense to say, if God is for us, who can be against him? Right? God's all-powerful. Obviously, no one can be against him. So why does he say, who can be against us? Because this has been the point of Romans 8. Romans 8 is, God has this divine, eternal plan when He's going to make all things new, and He has adopted us into that plan so that we can share in that and participate in that, so we're part of that plan. So the, the reason that we can rest, that no one is going to stop God's will taking place, and we've been adopted into that, so no one's going to stop God's will for us taking place, this is why we can say with confidence, if God is for us, then who can be Against us, no one can keep God from accomplishing what he's trying to do. Again, we're trying to get to this more than overcomers statement, and Paul is, is building a case for that. And the first case is, if God is for us, then, then no one can prevent and stop God from accomplishing his will. Then we get to that second question. The question is, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? But the premise is, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. Or here's another way of looking at this question. Who is ultimately responsible for the death of Jesus? Who do we blame for the death of Jesus? I mean, you could blame Judas. He's the one who betrayed Jesus, gave him up, gave insider information. We could blame Pilate. He's the actual government figure that actually ordered his execution, so we could blame him. We could blame the crowds. Pilate offered a way out, and the crowd said, no, we want you to crucify him. And Acts 4 makes it clear there were Jews and Gentiles in that crowd. Um, we could, could really even blame Jesus. 
Jesus said, no one takes my life from me, I lay it down. But Romans 8 makes it pretty clear who ultimately is responsible for the death of Jesus. It is God the Father. God the Father gave him up for us all. The one who is ultimately responsible for the death of the Son of God is the Father of the Son of God. And that's an amazing statement to make. So we can dispense with this silly accusation of calling the Jews Christ killers. Look, the Scriptures are clear. The one ultimately responsible for the death of Christ is God the Father. He's the one who gave Him up for us all and did not spare His own Son. Now, why is this this significant as we're building up towards this more than overcomers because the question that always comes up in times of suffering and groaning and pain the question that will always rise up at some point is does God love me and can I trust him to love me through this that's the question that always arises does he care about me Does he have a plan for my life? If he loves me, why is he letting this happen? If he's for us, then why not defeat this enemy right now? If he really loved me, he would do this and he would do that. That question always will will begin to rise up. And notice how much it saturates the end of this. In verse 37, the question is, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? In verse 35, excuse me. The whole chapter ends with nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This, This question just continues to rise over and up. And what Romans 8 is trying to remind us of is this very simple truth. The cross settles the question of whether or not God loves you forever. God demonstrates his love towards you and that while you were yet sinners, Christ died for you. That question of whether he loves you, whether he cares about you, whether he's aware of your life, whether he desires to have a relationship with you, whether he's included you to be his child, all of those questions have been settled on the cross. He has demonstrated and answered that question. He did not spare his own son. Can you imagine the audacity of that plan? I mean, can you imagine someone being so bold to ask for that plan? Coming to God the Father, hey, I know we've messed up. I know we've rebelled against you. I know we disobeyed your commands. I know, in fact, we're still in active rebellion against you. But, but this is what you should do. You should send your one and only son into this mess and become sin for us. You should nail him to the cross as the once and for all sacrifice. And then you should offer to us the gift of forgiveness. And all we have to do to receive it is say, yes, that's what you should do. Can you imagine actually proposing that to God the Father as a solution for our sin? And yet that is exactly what the Father did. He did not spare his own son, but he gave him up for us all. The question of God's love for us has been answered on the cross. We keep coming back to the cross over and over and over because we need to, because the suffering and groaning keeps coming back over and over and over as well, and we need to remind ourselves God's love for us is a settled issue. If that's true, then the question is, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Makes us ask the question, well, what are all things, right? I mean, obviously, all things are not things that are evil. All things are not things that are going to be outside of the will of God. Not going to be contrary to His purpose. What would be all things? We came up with the same question in that great promise of Romans 8, 28. When God works all things together for good. How do we define good? But I think there's a parallel between these two questions. right? Verse 31 says, who can be against us? That's the the wording of the question. The message, though, is that no one can really stop God from accomplishing His will in your life and His will in His creation. So it doesn't matter who tries to be against you. No one's going to be victorious against you. I think there's the same thing. God has demonstrated His love for us and will graciously give us all things. What if the all things has been defined by Romans 8 all along? So what if the all things is that there's no condemnation in Christ? That your sin debt has been canceled, has been forgiven, has been wiped away? What if the all things is that you are no longer a slave to sin? The power of your sin nature has been broken and you have been set free. 
What if the all things is you have been reborn in your mind so that you can discern the spiritual things of God? What if the all things is that the spirit within you gives life to your mortal bodies? Your mortal body still giving life and love and joy and hope and peace and that which makes life really life. It is the spirit who gives that even in your mortal bodies. What if the all things, it's through the power of the Spirit that you're able to put to death the deeds of the flesh and be conformed to the image of Christ? What if the all things is the assurance of the Holy Spirit speaking in your heart that yes, you are a child of God, yes, you belong to me, yes, you belong uh, as a child of the King? What if all things is the gift of being able to pray to God as Abba, Father, and even when you don't know how to pray, resting in the fact that the Spirit is interceding for you according to the will of God. What if the all things is the glory yet to be revealed? What if the all things is the freedom of the glory of the children of God? What if the all things is to justify you by grace through faith? What if the all things is the promise to be glorified with Christ? He's, he's been describing all of the things all along and saying because He's demonstrated His love for you, He will graciously give you all things. Perhaps this is what the psalmist meant in Psalm 84. No good things does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Maybe this is what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 6. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Maybe this is what Paul meant when he wrote to the church in Corinth. All things are yours. Whether the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours. You are Christ's and Christ's is God's. What if the all things, what if we set our eyes on all these things instead of the treasures of this world, a world that is passing away? How would that change how we experience suffering and groaning as we're trying to figure out how to be more than conquerors? If you and I had the kind of faith, the kind of faith in a sovereign, loving, eternal God who is at work in and through us for his eternal good. How might we express that in one concise little sentence? We might say, if God is for us, who can be against us? You know, and perhaps instead of spending our lives and our prayer and energy asking God to to spare us from suffering and groaning, perhaps we'd be bold enough to ask God to use us for his glory so that others might know the beauty and greatness of who this God is and what it's like to be in Christ and to be graciously given all of these things. Perhaps if we love God and are called according to His purpose, we would march boldly into the darkness because we know God is for us. It doesn't really matter who is against us because nothing is going to prevent God from accomplishing His will in us and through us. And because we are loved God and we are called according to His purpose, that means it will be accomplished His will for us us and we could say with confidence if God is for us then who can be against us I know this doesn't answer all of that we're moving towards how can we say we're more than over more than conquerors even as we are suffering or groaning we've got just these building blocks today that if God is for us then it doesn't really matter who's in opposition or what's in opposition. Nothing is going to prevent God from accomplishing His will in and through us. And the second building block is because God's demonstrated His love for us in such a powerful, conclusive way. All of these things in Romans 8 that we've been reading, that we long for, will be graciously given to us because of His love demonstrated on the cross. So we're adding these blocks as we're trying to get to this end point of being able to say we are more than conquerors through Christ who loves us. The song that we get to sing is a song of response this morning. I want you to, as you sing this song, we've sung this song before, it's just the song Abide. The lyrics say this, you're the way, the truth, and the life. You're the well that never runs dry. Be my strength, my song in the night. Be my all, my treasure, my prize. I'm yours forever you're mine. Draw me close and teach me to abide. If you think about the words we're about to sing in relation to Romans 8 and as we're trying to get to this conclusion of Romans 8, how it is that we could say we're, we're more than conquerors even as we are suffering and groaning that 
we are that the secret to that is found in Christ. Christ being our strength, Christ being our song in the night, realizing that Christ has to be our treasure, Christ has to be our prize. We can't be chasing other things. We've got to be finding in Christ and really saying with conviction, not just words on a screen, you're the way, the truth, and the life, but really saying with our soul in the midst of this broken world, you are the way, you are the truth, you are the life. And if I'm going to get to a spot where I can really say with confidence we are more than conquerors, it is coming through abiding in Christ because He is, in fact, the well that never runs dry. So may we sing this as a confession of faith this morning.